God, some of these subclasses are so badly misplaced it physically hurts. Champion above Samurai and Eldritch Knight? Ouch. Ouch. Hello players and GMs, I am Reese, and welcome to another video by Jetpack7. Before we get started into this video, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for all of your massive support over the course of 2020. In fact, everyone at Jetpack7 would like to extend their warmest thanks. This year has been less than ideal for everyone, but that hasn't slowed you all down in the slightest. This channel has seen massive growth throughout the year, and the book we announced performed slightly better even than Legendary Dragons, which had been our biggest success up to that point. I thought it would be fun to go back 365 days to see how much has changed, and uh, let's just say... It's a lot. Since December of 2019, I have gained 2.3 thousand subscribers. For reference, I have just over 2,500 now, so that's nearly all of them. I also had 17 and a half thousand hours of watch time on my videos, which is the equivalent of watching Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King around 4,200 times, and that's the extended edition. We broke 100,000 views on my videos too. In fact, we are closer to 130,000 now, so that is just incredible. I could go on, but I'll end it by just saying that this year has been one of growth in so many different ways. And when it comes to the YouTube channel and Jetpack 7 as a whole, 100% of it is because of you you. So, to properly thank you all, I decided to make a video dedicated to the commenters. And I thought, what better way to dedicate a video to the commenters than to address the commenters directly. So I combed through my videos, found some comments I loved, some that made me laugh, and some I wanted to respond to, but as is the case with any YouTube channel, I've gotten plenty of not so nice comments, but hey, all comments matter, interaction is interaction, so I knew I had to include the controversial comments as well. I hope you enjoy watching the video as much as I enjoyed making it. Have you ever played a fighter? Your rankings suggest no. God, some of these subclasses are so badly misplaced it physically hurts. Champion above Samurai and Eldritch Knight? Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Bro, you don't know odds, but okay. Illusionist as the worst? LOL, you clearly lack any creativity. He is so bad at ranking classes, it's funny. funny, funny, funny. I don't say this to be an ass, but I think you might have a slight reading comprehension issue. I've watched several of your subclass ranking videos, and I think about 85% of your assertions are objectively disprovable. Come on, dude. Kevin Castle says, I made a mistake in my first big battle as a DM. We all do. I literally made my poor players kill every single enemy combatant. Like, 100 of them. Oof. They were mad, but I insisted. Ugh, hindsight. It's alright, Kevin Castle. We've all made that mistake. I know I have. I've played in uh, campaigns where combat just kind of drags on way too long. It's not uncommon at all. And the fact that you're able to go back and look at it and understand that you made a mistake and regret it ever so slightly, that's a good sign. That means that you probably won't make that mistake in the future, which is the most important thing. As long as you're able to improve as you're DMing, that is truly what matters the most. If you haven't gotten to that point yet, if you haven't made that mistake yet, if you're wanting to, to get into DMing, then I highly recommend you watch some videos about how to run combat, maybe the one that I made before. Because there are very smart people out there who have crafted incredible combat ideas. And they make YouTube videos, they write books about it, there is so much material out there to help you learn how to properly run combat and make combat interesting and fast-paced for your players. Because to me, in my opinion, that is the part of D&D that can drag on the most, is just a really long slog of combat and we've all run one we've all had our combat that we kind of regret but as long as we're able to see that we made a mistake and move forward from that and hopefully not make that mistake again or at least not often then i think we're okay as a dm and i think you are too 
Lassadar said uh, nine months ago, are you going to do a breakdown of archetypes per class as well? See, okay, that is where I got that idea. This is proof. Let this act as proof that I do, in fact, read your comments and get ideas of videos from them. Because this person, uh, Lassadar, whoever you are, commented nine months ago asking me if I was going to rank every class archetype in the game. And it turns out that that was going to be my longest running series that I've done so far, and the one that kind of lasted all throughout 2020 and ended up being the largest contributor to the growth of the channel. So this one comment gave me this idea, and I wrote it down and committed to it, and it ended up being a huge part of the channel and its growth. So thank you so much, Lazadar, and thank you to everyone else who comments video ideas on my stuff and what they want to see, because it really does help me get an understanding of what you all want. I make these videos for you all, and for me, it's fun, and I want you all to get what you want out of it. So when you say something like, are you going to do this kind of video? I would like to see this kind of video. I actually do really take that into account and it does help me get ideas. Sometimes I won't take them exactly, I'll kind of mix them together with another idea that I had, but either way, it's inspiration, and inspiration is what I need to continue making videos, so thank you all very much for continuing to contribute. One week ago, Talon says, great video, thank you. Great comment. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Lopez says, Artificers are cool, but honestly are super annoying to DM for. Aw. If they dump their created magic items into AC boosters for themselves, then their AC can get to like 30 by level 20, which is ridiculous. Also, they have shield. They do. They do have shield. And they do get uh, very high proficiencies. They add plus 17 to saving throws they are proficient in at that level. Yes. At level 20, Artificers are absolutely insane. You're right about that. And if they do dump all of their created magic items into AC boosters, they can get an extremely high ADC. You're also right about that. That said, I've played a character with extremely high AC. It was back in one of the old UA renditions of the Stone Sorcerer, back when they would get, uh, I think they added their constitution modifier to their AC or something. Uh, and I had 20 constitution and I think 18 charisma on the Sorcerer, so immediately my AC was really, really high, and then I just stacked on AC items and I would use shield and stuff, and my AC would get up to like 25, and I was like a level seven sorcerer or something like that. It was absolutely ridiculous. That said, I quickly realized the weakness with high AC is that you want to wade into combat and all that, and when you stack everything into your AC, there's a couple parts of your character that are a little weaker than others. In my experience, it was namely dexterity saving throws. Dex saves are still extremely deadly, extremely common. Another thing that oftentimes ends up being pretty low is wisdom saves for dominate spells and stuff like that. Strength saves, con saves, you will have a weakness at some point, even if you stack all the way into AC. So monsters might try to attack you and it might feel kind of useless to attack that person with a monster, but if you toss a creature in there that forces them to make a dex save, they're probably not going to do so hot. Not to mention, if you do have a dominate person or a dominate monster spell or something at your use as the DM, then sicking your player with 30 AC against your party can be pretty crippling and very, very fun. <laughs> as the DM, not for the party. So while I do agree that uh, some of, like, when you do have a player who's uh, kind of min-maxing really hard about stacking into AC, it can cause frustration as a DM, especially at lower levels, but like you said, at, at 20th level, that's when they really have this huge spike in power, and by the time you're at 20th level, I think AC is the least of your concerns. I have run 20th level characters, and I've played in a 20th level party, and AC might as well not exist. The amount that I'm rolling when I'm DMing against level 20 characters is usually well above 30, at least well into the late 20s. Not to mention the scariest thing that you're up against at 20th level is like 9th level spells, 8th level spells, that kind of stuff. So I'm a lot more worried about that than having a really high AC. And also, oftentimes, if you do have a ridiculously high AC, your health isn't necessarily super high. So if one hit gets through, that can really cause your character some trouble, especially when you're fighting stuff at 20th level that's going to be hitting you for like, I don't know, 40, 12 at the minimum or something. So Ryan, I can get your frustration, uh, but I personally very much like the Artificer class and I would encourage you to let your players be able to play it and maybe just steer them away from min-maxing out their AC a little bit or something like that. They have weaknesses, and it's okay as a DM to exploit those weaknesses a little bit. Put in a couple things here or there that will actually challenge your players, because it is your game, you are designing it for the players, and it's not fun if they can just skate through without taking any damage. So add in some challenges. Don't intentionally ruin their game, but give them something that will actually challenge them. Add in some puzzles, add in some stuff that isn't necessarily 
conventional Dungeons and Dragons. And I can almost guarantee that you won't have as much of an issue with it if you do that. So in one of my videos, I talked about the alchemical jug and how you can make mayonnaise out of it. And I asked my commenters to give me some creative uses for mayonnaise, some mechanical advantages for mayonnaise. And a lot of people talked about it being used as a grease spell, but I just wanted to highlight a few of the comments because um, this is a comment that only exists on my video. I, I can guarantee you that this comment, nothing similar to this comment has ever been said on another video. Bluebird32 said, so many good ideas for mayonnaise. You guys are really putting on a mayo clinic. Out of context, it's one of the best comments. Like, one of the best YouTube comments I could possibly imagine. Shortly followed by a comment from Long Tran. I'm sorry if this is your name and I'm, I'm butchering it. Uh, I used mayo for torture. We captured a bandit and some of us had qualms against violence, so we just fed the bandit mayo every day. <laughs> That's just really funny. That's great. The comments that don't help me think of new video ideas, these are the comments that I really love too. <laughs> they carry with them their own special kind of value, and the fact that I have a comment section talking about the creative and deadly uses of mayonnaise, I, I really think I've made it as a content creator at that point. Andrew Hazelwood says, I really dislike the bard concept. Aww. The tone just doesn't mesh well with most of the games I've played. Thankfully, of all the games I've played, only one person played a bard. The only times he made much of a difference in the dungeon crawl we were playing was when he helped out in situations that only went south because our party of four was effectively a party of three with a tag along. That's so sad. The bard is one of my favorite classes and I see people bash it all the time and I think there's there's kind of this play style associated with bards that people don't really like, which is distracting the game, like kind of um, diverting the focus of the game, maybe being just a pest, maybe. People associate bards with annoying characters. And while I think it, it fits, I guess, but it's not necessary at all. You can make a cool bard. You can make an awesome bard. Not to mention, bards are so helpful in combat. I think people massively undersell how powerful a bard is in combat. Bardic Inspiration is one of the flat out strongest mechanics in the game, in my opinion, because they get so much of it. It doesn't cost them anything. They have like at least four or five uses of it ready at any given time. Some of the uses of Bardic Inspiration, like Glamour Bard's Inspiration, is absolutely insane. And being able to have access to that in a combat is honestly really game changing. It is it is to me the truest support class in the game because even a cleric can wade into combat and be more combat focused without having to necessarily focus on support. They can be a primary caster of a party and dish out a good amount of damage. But a bard doesn't have access to that unless they take it through magical secrets. And even then I think that's selling themselves short. One of my favorite things to do as a bard is to use magical secrets to take spells from classes like Paladin or Ranger that normally wouldn't get access to these really potent spells until much later in the game. Because they are built around the idea that Paladin, like Aura of Vitality, is a spell that is really, really strong on a bard. It's an action to cast and then you can use a bonus action every turn to heal a party member within 60 feet for 2d6. I mean, people talk about healing word being broken. You can do healing word, essentially, every single turn with one spell. And that is a spell that a bard can get, a lore bard at least, at 5th level. So to say that a bard isn't actually strong in a combat sense to me is grossly inaccurate and it's something that I hear a lot of people say. I just don't think people put the same value on utility and support as they do on being able to completely end a combat with like a single casting of a spell. But when you have a paladin going up against like an undead boss, like say you're fighting a Draco Lich or something and the AC is really high or whatever and your paladin really needs to hit the single hit, having that extra inspiration to tack onto the attack roll can honestly change the course of the entire fight and allow your Party to maximize their damage as much as they normally want to. I think bards are really great. I love bards and I will stand by that until the day I die. This is the hill that I will die on. I'll remake my wizard video, but I'm not remaking my bard video. So I hope if there's one thing I want to do with this YouTube channel, it's encourage people to play bards more. That's not true, but that is one of my goals. I do want to make people play bards more. Howler452 says, I once had a player who was the metagamer, the robot, a really bad one at that, and the boss. 
This is in reference to my uh, DM video talking about the different types of DMs that nobody wants to play with. That tied in with an extra aspect of metagaming you didn't bring up, and that's what I like to call backstory exploitation. I think I know where this one is going, where they use their backstory as an excuse to have knowledge they otherwise wouldn't have. Now, this would be okay if the player talked with their GM about what they did and did not know about beforehand. This player did none of that and would instead say he knew X because of X and therefore he also knew Y. It got so bad that the other players even had to tell him to stop it. Yeah, that can be rough. That's definitely kind of a little subsect of metagaming is using player knowledge of what your character would have to do to know certain pieces of information. That is kind of like a it's like the next level of metagaming. It's like, well, I, I know this because my my character would know this. But, you know, that's still that's still like you said, it's, it, it is definitely still backstory exploitation. And and like you said, again, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem if that player had confirmed it with the DM. This is something I always tell my players. If you want your character to have some sort of special backstory, some sort of special place in the world, I'm all for it. In fact, I, I encourage that. I want my players to feel like their characters are an active part of the world and that they do have a past and that they have experience and knowledge of this world that they're playing in. Even if the players themselves aren't as familiar with the homebrew setting or, or whatever setting that I'm running them in right now. I want them to feel like their characters know even more about the world than they, the players, do because those characters have actually been living in that world. So when the players come to me and they say, can my player have this sort of background and have this sort of knowledge in this specific field? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And we will craft a story to be able to allow them to have that knowledge and be able to justify having that knowledge. However, when a player just kind of assumes that they would know certain things, it does cause me some frustration because that isn't something that we discussed ahead of time. I just want to know what the characters know so that I can introduce something and have a player kind of be genuinely confused by it. I sometimes want to be able to introduce stuff to my campaigns that my players might be familiar with, but the characters themselves have never interacted with before. And when a player is like, oh yeah, I know what that is because I've done a light investigation into Arcana or something like that, then it can be frustrating to me because then I feel like I have to shut that player down and say, no, you don't know any of this. And I don't like, I don't like telling my players no. I always want to say yes, if I can, but uh, when a player doesn't ask ahead of time or carry a conversation with me about what their character may or may not know, then oftentimes I will end up having to shut them down and tell them, no, that is not the case. You simply don't. You don't. Your character doesn't know this thing. And I think most DMs are like that. I think most DMs would agree with me. If you are a player and you want your character to know specific pieces of information that a normal level one adventurer may not know, then just go to your DM about it. Talk to them. Again, so many things in D&D can just be solved by open and honest communication. And this is another one of those things. You want something specific for your character, bring it up to your DM. They will either say no and just shut it down or say yes. And then they will work with you to help you make sure that your character can feel like an integrated part of that world. And that is at the end of the day, all we ever want in D&D is for our characters to feel like they actually exist. All right, those are all of the comments I've got for today. Thank you all again so, so much for being a huge part, the entire part of the growth of the channel. I seriously don't know what 2020 would have looked like without you all, probably much less interesting or exciting. So let's do our best to keep it up in 2021. I can't wait to see where we will end up. But as always, until then, thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you around.